there, I'm Miss Meeks and I'm just going to read out letter one from Frankenstein. So this is the first thing that we read right at the start of the story. And it's to Mrs Savile in England. And it's from St Petersburg, December 11th. You will rejoice to hear that no disaster has accompanied the commencement of an enterprise which you have regarded with such evil forebodings. I arrived here yesterday and my first task is to assure my dear sister of my welfare and increasing confidence in the success of my undertaking. So that's the first paragraph and what we have here is we've got in the first line that there has been no disaster and obviously the sister was somewhat afraid um, because he says that you were regarded with such evil forebodings. So his first job that he's done um, once he's arrived safely is to reassure his sister. Now there's a couple of things straight away with this that we can talk about because like with any gothic fiction story, maybe something evil is going to happen and maybe his trip isn't quite going to be so smooth sailing. So what we have here really um, from Mary Shelley is perhaps some foreshadowing of something that's going to happen later on to interrupt the, um, the trip. So I'm already far north of London and as I walk the streets of Petersburg I feel, to feel a cold northern breeze playing upon my cheeks which braces my nerves and fills me with delight. Do you understand this feeling, this breeze which has travelled from the regions towards which I am advancing, gives me a foretaste of those icy climes. So this reference here to um, the cold and the wind, whilst Clerval's really excited about it, normally when we have things that are cold and icy, that can be quite threatening. Um, but perhaps he's, he's slightly naive here in thinking that all is well. We also have this vivid description of um, the setting and the scenery, which really fits in nicely with the romantic genre. Um, so, inspirited by the wind of promise. So this is also quite significant, the wind of promise, because this really was a time of, of adventure and of exploration. Um, and so we, whoever's writing this letter is probably um, very quite very quite is probably someone that's quite um that would have represented how lots of people felt in this time period my daydreams become more fervent and vivid so we've got this idea of imagination coming in um and we know that this was a time of innovation and imagination i try in vain to be persuaded that the pole is the seat of frost so i think here he's talking about the north pole um, if it ever presents itself to my imagination of the region of beauty and delight, these things all adding in with the romantic genre, because obviously we've got nature being beautiful um, and the power of nature, things like that. There, Margaret, the sun is forever visible in, in its broad disk, just skirting the horizon and diffusing a perpetual splendour. There, for with your leave, my sister, I will put some trust in preceding navigators. There, snow and frost are banished, and sailing over a calm sea, we may be wafted to a land surpassing in wonders and in beauty every region hitherto discovered on the habitable globe. So he's really getting carried away. These sentences are so long, and he's like letting his imagination run away with him. Its productions and features may be without example, as the phenomena of the heavily bodies undoubtedly are in those undiscovered solitudes. So this constant reference of, of new and discovery and the fact that he's going somewhere that has never been visited before and he's clearly very excited about it. This is going to tie in with Victor Frankenstein and the idea of him going somewhere that, that's never been gone before but his is more in scientific inquiry and scientific discovery. But obviously we don't know about that yet because it's only the first page. So, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Its productions and features may be without example as the phenomena of the he heavenly bodies undoubtedly are in those undiscovered solitudes. Undiscovered again. What may not be expected in a country of eternal light? I may there discover a wondrous power which tracks the needle and may regulate a thousand celestial observations that require only this voyage to render their seeming 
eccentricities consistent forever. Oh, it's quite wordy there, difficult to read. Um, but what he's doing again, we, we've got these long descriptions, we've got um, lots of sort of symbolic imagery and metaphors um, for, for, the, for this discovery. I shall satiate my ardent curiosity with the sight of a part of the world never before visited and may tread a land never before imprinted by the foot of man. These are my enticements and they are sufficient to conquer all fear of death or danger and to induce me to commence the, this laborious voyage with the joy a child feels when he embarks in a little boat with his holiday mates on an expedition of discovery up his native river. So him referring to himself as a joyous child here shows the unrelenting excitement he feels about going on this great adventure and it's taking him back to you know, that feeling of when you first go out on your own as a young child. But supposing all these conjectures to be false, you cannot contest the inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind to the last gener generations by discovering a passage near the pole to these countries to reach which at present so many months are requisite or by ascertaining the secret of the magnet... It's quite interesting, um, actually, if we think of science and we think of magnetism, and obviously we know that we have the north and the south poles of a magnet, and they actually um, match up with the north and south poles. So the magnetic pull is, is obviously something that's known at this time. These reflections have dispelled the agitation which I began my letter, and I feel my heart glow with enthusiasm which elevates me to heaven, for nothing contributes so much tranquils the mind as a steady purpose, a point on which the soul may fix its intellectual eye. So this idea of looking, discovering, we've got the intellectual eye there, all adding in with this sense of adventure and new beginnings and um, expeditions. This expedition has been the favourite dream of my early years. I read with ardour the accounts of various voyages which have been made in the prospect of arriving at the North Pacific Ocean through the seas which surround the, po the Pole. You may remember that a history of all voyages made for purposes of discovery composed the whole of our good uncle Thomas's library. My education was neglected, yet I was passionately fond of reading... These volumes were my study day and night, and my familiarity with them increased that regret which I had felt as a child on learning that my father's dying injunction had forbidden my uncle to allow me to embark in a seafaring life. So this is something that he's dreamed of his whole life. And um, he's obviously developed a strong love of it by reading all of the books in his uncle's library. These visions faded when I perused for the first time those poets whose effusions entranced my soul and lifted it to heaven. I also became a poet and for one year lived in a paradise of my own creation. I imagined that I might obtain a niche in the temple where names of Homer and Shakespeare are cons consecrated. You are well acquainted with my failure and how heavily I bore the disappointment. But just at that time I inherited the fortune of my cousin and my thoughts were turned into the channel of their earlier bend. So he's talking here about how um, once he was told that he wasn't allowed to be an explorer, he decided to sort of live in a world of his own creation. So that's where he's talking about how he became a poet and he would write his own stories and he hoped that one day he would be as famous as Homer and Shakespeare. But he wasn't particularly good at it, unfortunately. And when he inherited some money and realised he could afford to go out on an exploration, then his ideas went back to his old dreams that he has as a child. Six years have passed since I resolved on my present undertaking. I can even now remember the hour from which I dedicated myself to this great enterprise. I commenced by inuring my body to hardship. I accompanied the whale fishers on several expeditions to the North Sea. I voluntarily endured cold, famine, thirst and want of sleep. I often worked harder than the common sailors during the day and devoted my nights to the study of mathematics, the theory of medicine and those branches of physical science from which a naval adventurer might derive the greatest practical advantage. So he is talking about the dedication that he's made. So he's obviously going to be prepared, or as prepared as he can be, for an expedition like this. 
Twice I actually hired myself as an undermate in a Greenland whaler and acquitted myself to admiration. I must own, I felt a little proud when my captain offered me the second dignity in the vessel and entreated me to remain with the greatest earnestness, so valuable did he consider my services. So we know Walton was obviously very good at his position because when he was going out and working as a whaler, um, the captains of the ship, they wanted to hire him. And now, my dear Margaret, so we know now that he's, he's definitely, we can see this is the form of a letter because he keeps referring to the audience um, and Margaret is his sister, as we know from earlier. So, and now, my, my dear Margaret, do I not deserve to accomplish some great purpose? Rhetorical questions there, always leaving the reader to feel like you've got to agree with them. My life might have been passed in ease and luxury, but I preferred glory to every enticement that wealth placed in my path. Oh, that some encouraging voice would answer in the affirmative. My courage and my resolution is firm, but my hopes fluctuate and my spirits are often depressed. I am about to proceed on a long and difficult voyage to say the least, the emergencies of which will demand all my fortitude. I am required not only to raise the spirits of others, but sometimes to sustain my own where theirs are failing. This is the most favourable period for travelling in Russia. They fly quickly over the snow in their sledges, the motion is pleasant, and, in my opinion, far more agreeable than that of an English stagecoach. The cold is not excessive if you are wrapped in furs, a dress which I have already adopted, for there is a great difference between walking the deck and remaining seated motionless for hours when no exercise prevents the blood from actually freezing in your veins. I have no ambition to lose my life on the post roads between St Petersburg and Arkenhall. I shall depart for the latter town in a fortnight or three weeks. My intention is to hire a ship there, which can easily be done by paying the insurance for the owner, and to engage as many sailors as I think necessary among those who are accustomed to the whaled fishing. I do not intend to sail until the month of June, and when shall I return? Ah, oh, dear sister, how can I answer this question? If I succeed many, many months, perhaps years will pass before you and I may meet. If I fail, you will see me again soon or never. Farewell, my dear, excellent Margaret. Heaven, shower down blessings on you and save me, that I may again and again testify my gratitude for all your love and kindness. Your affectionate brother, R. Walton. So that's it. That's our first letter and that's introducing our story, which it doesn't really feel like this is going to be a story about a, a monster that's been brought to life by electricity and is going to walk around killing people. It seems like it's going to be a story about an adventure on a ship. But this is quite interesting because there's a few parallels, as I've already said, between this sense of exploration, whether that be um, physically exploring the world or exploring the realms of science, which Victor Frankenstein does. Okay, I hope this has been helpful and I'll be back soon. Bye.